Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Bajinski and today I am talking to the awesome Nicole Holt. We're talking about Nicole's experience coming into academia. We touch on lots of issues in this episode um, and particularly around Nicole's Viva experience. And after the interview had finished, we talked more about that particular moment and how difficult it was. And this sense of really needing to think about looking after yourself in that hour after the Viva, what's going to happen after the Viva, the support there. So, um, but within the interview, Nicole gives lots of good advice and also just um, a gorgeous vibe. So I do hope you enjoy this episode. Nicole. Hi Emma, thank you for having me today. You are so welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I was just saying because it's coming up to the beginning of the term and I know you must be super, super busy. So I really, really appreciate your time and your your willingness to kind of talk about your story um, into the into the PhD and out the other side. Um, so I always begin with asking people about that. So can you tell us a little bit about the kind of the, the scope of your story? Okay, so basically, and my story, and this is funny enough how my PhD starts, is that I grew up in Hastings, and I grew up in a town that was full of poverty, and I grew up on a council estate, and um, it wasn't the life that I wished for myself, Mm -hmm. and I went to a very difficult school, but I had the most fantastic teacher called Dr. K, who who taught me religious studies, and I'm not a religious person at all, but I just love the subject so much. And then I kind of luckily scraped enough um, free C's to come study at university. And I've always been interested in health and um, beliefs, basically. And I also did um, health as one of my A-levels and I loved it. And so I wanted to study both of the, both of them at university, and that's kind of why I ended up at Christchurch was because I could do both at the same time, Amazing. which was which was great for me. And so I did my undergrad degree here, and I just didn't want to leave. This is where I found my place. I liked learning, and obviously, when you, um, so I'm 30 now, and I went to university when I was 18. So for my masters, you had to pay for it yourself. So I had to work at the same time as doing my masters. And then I, yeah, which is in public health. And then I started my journey of my PhD. Amazing. And we're going to talk about more about that in a minute. (laughs) Um, I love giving shout outs to people on this podcast. And Dr. K, (laughs) thank you. Thank you to Dr. K. And, you know, it's so important. Inspirational teachers are so important. And I know that we'll be talking on the podcast to other people who are teachers and knowing that you can change the trajectory of someone's life. You really can. Um, And so I love that. And, And good job. And and this sense of you coming in and finding your place. And that was going to be our sort of theme. We were thinking, what could we talk about today? And this theme of finding your place in academia, because that can be really difficult um, for people for all sorts of reasons. Yeah, I think it'd be particularly difficult as well. So I was the first one in my family to go to university and and I didn't realise it at the, the time, but my dad really struggles to read and write. And I struggled to read and write. And it wasn't until I went to university and one of my lecturers pulled me aside and said, Nicole, I don't understand your work. You, when you speak, you really have this knowledge, but your writing isn't ma- matching up. I think there's something wrong mm. here. Mm. And that's how I got diagnosed as being dyslexic. It's funny, isn't it? It is. Well, yeah. funny in one way. Yeah. And also, you know, that situation for your, for your dad, who went well for you to get to that point and all that you have done to get to that point and for your dad to not to to kind of be working with that you know it's like it's the swan isn't it pedaling double double speed underneath um very difficult yeah what a challenge what a challenge mm. and I think that sense of of kind of, of I just want to applaud that kind of that that going off to university and being open to all of that that is you know I ca- I grew up on a council state too <laughs> <Came from laughs> first person in my family went to university and that it's it's 
partly it's really exciting, isn't it? But also yeah. that's tell us a little bit about how it was to then to oh. kind of be in there. Yeah, I have to tell you, Emma, when my mum and dad, they drove me all the way, so I come from Hastings, and I get, I'm at Canterbury University, and my mum and dad drove me up at the accommodation, and my mum just just stood there, dropped me off at my halls, and she just sobbed. <laughs> she was, it was happy tears, but it was yeah. scary for them, yeah. as well as for me, because it was not a world they understand, and it's still not a world that we completely understand. It's, no. you, you know, I'm very privileged. I recognise I'm very privileged to be here. Yeah, well, and I think it's that thing, isn't it? And, and there's a challenge. So there is a real privilege, but also stepping out into something completely new where the people who are dearest to you don't really understand what it is you're doing. There, there's a thing in, in that, I think. Um, yeah. So so um, how was it? So they, drop, they dropped you off. You did, you did yeah. your undergraduate. That all went all right. <laughs> Yeah. And then I decided, you know what, let's do a PhD. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So talk us through that decision then. Yeah. Um, so basically, I knew that I, I did my master's and I wanted to continue studying. And I, I've always had this real fascination with how, so my PhD is on people who are spiritual but not religious and how that affects their health. And, I'm, and I sit in the field of public health. So we're really interested mm. in looking at broadness and and depth yes. and for me I was so so interested I've always been interested and then I started looking at literature and and that's kind of how it started for me I I then joined to do my PhD part-time at Christchurch as well as working part-time because I couldn't afford not to work yes um, yes and I was, I was do you know what at the time I was working three jobs you know we think I can't looking back wow, retrospectively yeah, you, you think, oh. gosh, how did I do this? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And how did you do it? So let's unpick that a little bit, because, again, yeah. this will be there. There are lots of people out there doing doing that thing, doing that, needing to work. Yeah, and then having I worked to a lot of nights. I worked right. as a carer in, in a in a home. Right. And um, I worked a lot of nights and at the night during the nights when it was quiet I was doing my studying right. and I think because I was at the time I was early in my 20s as well so that that helped but I've yes. definitely paid for it in my 30s <laughs> right 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 because that is a lot of energy and burning the candle at both ends really yeah yeah so you're yeah. so you're so you're in your PhD you're working you're doing your PhD part-time you're mm. did you have support for dyslexia in 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 that program or so I wouldn't have said that I had really good support for my undergraduate right. and my master's. But when I joined to do my PhD, I, all that support sort of went because mm. I think at that time and I think graduate schools have a lot of work to do around supporting students with additional needs. Yes. Um, but so, yes. And partly as well. I So for me, I sadly, I didn't... Um, my supervisors sadly kept leaving me I didn't leave any of them but I went through mm. um four or five different supervisors oh, and they were sort of, yeah, some retired some went to different universities uh one lady went on maternity leave twice so I really had um for me I perceived to not have the as much support as what I needed um yes. but I survived Emma yeah <laughs> like well yeah well, and I, I just, I really, I mean, uh, congratulations on that and, get, and getting through that because that's no easy journey. And I think I asked the question of what support you had because I kind of guessed that it might not be so good because, as you say, actually, thank goodness we're getting better at supporting undergrads. But when you get yeah. into the PhD, often you have to be really proactive to get support um, around um any sort of uh, special equipment or things like that, you have to really um, uh, be vociferous about it. Um, and in terms of that supervisor, how did you manage the, the change of supervisors, which again can be quite a common oh, experience? Not very well, Emma. Right, um, right. So every time you get a new supervisor, and I'm sure there are people listening to this who can so hear me when I say these yeah. words, 
they bring new ideas to your thesis that <laughs> which is a blessing <laughs> and a curse right <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely and one thing I did have and she was continuous throughout actually was Tammy who was my dyslexia support tutor right. so one of right. the things I was able to have because I fought for it like you yes. said yeah. um was I had her one hour a week and oh she was fantastic and Tammy yeah. you, you know t- Oh, poor Tammy. She, she no, had we love Tammy. <laughs> we love Tammy. She was there throughout it all. Yeah, she really, really, really was. And um, so she, she was, at times, I think she would say herself, she felt a little bit out of her depth with me, but right, we, we survived right. and she was so consistent. And things like I didn't have a really good vibe, and we can talk about that in a minute. Yes. And um, she was the first person that I could really talk to about this really difficult experience. And she, I really felt like she heard me. And that was one thing that I felt quite a lot of times through my PhD experiences that I wasn't heard. You know, when you're telling people you're struggling and you're not being heard, it's really important. And that's something that I've, I've learned um, from, from that experience to make sure that my students always feel like they hear me, that I hear them. Amazing, amazing. And I think that that, that experience shows us that actually it, it is it is you said that word consistency having someone someone or some people who take who are with you consistently through the journey they aren't necessarily it's not necessarily your supervisor it could be someone else um, oh, they, absolutely. they're there throughout your journey that, that's really really important and I am so uh, thank you Tammy for doing for, for being there for you um so yes, let's go on to the Viva then. Let's talk about, so so you got through this, you got through the change of supervisors, you got the support that you needed for the, the dyslexia and you got to the Viva. Yeah, okay. So this is a, so this is a really difficult part of my thesis. So it took me a long time to write my thesis. Being dyslexic and I, I have ADHD as well, I finally managed to finish this thesis and then it, COVID happened right. <laughs> and then all right. of a sudden Vivas were online and it was something that I hadn't had much of experience of having um, an online Viva, mm. uh, uh, online anything, yeah, was yeah, it really? Yeah. We, we all had to do a lot of learning. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so I had an online Viva and my Viva was pre-viva I had a mocking viva and people sort of give you really mixed information don't they they say this is how you know different ways of how to prepare some say don't over prepare some say you know practice some questions and things and I and I did those things I had a mock viva and the actual viva was I was sitting at home in my living room and it was just (laughs) it just went on and on and on and very quickly so I I had to um I didn't have a good outcome from my viva. I got the option to um resubmit. Is that what it's called? Resubmit? Yeah, What's resubmit. Yeah, 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 resubmit. So um I had to go away and do a lot of work, but I can remember being in this viva and she just one of I had two external examiners because I remember stuff where I am. And this isn't a reflection of the examiners, they were they're lovely, wonderful women, but for me it just it just didn't go well Mm. (laughs) and they kept pressuring me to answer these questions and I just couldn't I was answering but I just couldn't answer them the way that they wanted me and I could feel very quickly in this viva that it wasn't going well and I was in there for a good couple of hours Mm. (laughs) and you know when you get that sense of feeling um, one thing so that was really, really, really difficult because my mum was waiting for the phone call, you know, because yes. you often hear a lot once yes. you've done the once you've written the PhD, that's it, you're you're on the home stretch. And oh, I couldn't call her. I just after that viva. Oh, oh and that was that was it. And that um some people probably will have the most amazing PhD experience, but that that isn't mine. <laughs> No. Um, so I wonder if I so I wonder and I can still I can hear it in your voice that's still is still with you and I'm I'm so sorry that that was the situation that you ended up in but to know that I think the the, the, the thing to say is that you did resubmit you did get it so it's, yeah. it's, it's that it, it it resubmission does not mean failure so let's just acknowledge that mm. right now but I wonder yeah. if there's any 
advice that you would give now, having been through that experience, give to yourself going into that Viva again? Much more practice, a lot more supervision, (laughs) get a proofreader. But so let's say once I had that, I I felt really, really in a dark place for a a couple of weeks. And for me, I then, I couldn't stay in academia for a while, Emma. I had to then go work. I I worked at my local authority. And then I was like six months in, I was like, no, I had this voice in the back of my head that, no, I had to come finish this. I had to come finish this for my my own soul. Like, Mm. you you know, when you're like, Mm. Mm. I Mm. need this chapter and I need it now. Yeah, Um, yeah. So I came back, I did this, I, I worked my socks off, I worked every weekend and I resubmitted it and then I had no more corrections and I was yes. waiting for more corrections. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, I, I think what I love is that it wouldn't leave you alone. Yeah. There's that, that uh, uh, revolution talks about this sense of unfinished business and this sense of kind of there's something in it that that PhD had called to you you'd answered the call and then it wouldn't let you go and you kind of called you back in and I love that you answered the call and that you 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 got there and you've you've, you were able to submit that and as you say for your soul I think there is something about completion we call it completion don't we and I think there is something about that moment um so you talk about then stepping away from academia um, and we I say we had a kind of notional title for, the, for this session about finding your place and I wonder if there's anything you'd like to say now then about sort of finding your place in academia out of all those experiences yeah because now so, you are a lecturer right so now you're now yeah, you're working yeah I'm a lecturer in public health and yeah. Um, yeah and I have the best job in the whole entire world Emma like my team I work with the best people I'm very lucky Oh um, and I, I am, um, yeah. So for me, that call, I liked working at the at the um, Canterbury City Council. I loved it, but it wasn't busy enough for me. I wasn't being academically challenged, right. and I realised that what I struggled with the vibe was for me probably like many people, it was so wrapped in my identity. Right. And actually, when I realised that actually this PhD doesn't need to be perfect, it just needs to be finished, and that's so then. I, so in the same time as me doing the changes, a, a lecturing post came up at Christchurch. And to be honest, Emma, I'd also applied for this, the same job three times and I got this job on, on the third go. So within sort of getting my PhD back, I also got my lecturing post at the same time, oh, which was really exciting. I but it was it. like all your ducks line up in, in a row. It was yes, really bizarre. It was your yeah. moment. And yeah. also just to mark this moment, this tenacity, that third time, it was the third time. And I think that so often we um, come to something and if it doesn't come off, we're like, right, well, that's it then, that's that done. And what I love about you is you're kind of like, do you know what? I'm going to do it again. I'm going to keep going. (laughs) It's brilliant, brilliant. Something um, another colleague told me um, once I had my first five outcome was that you need to get comfortable sitting with failure and actually I took that with me and uh, you know anybody else listening to this you know it's really difficult to feel comfortable with failure but when you do the world is is your oyster because actually one door shuts one door opens all the time absolutely oh I love that so much (laughs) I love that one door shuts door opens (laughs) Um, I always, I'm always looking out for what the quote is going to be coming out of this um, podcast episode. I think, I think we've got it. I think we've got it there. <laughs> um, so, so much in there, Nicole. And I think just even just being with you for a while, and and your your spirit, your positivity, and your your I say your tenacity, and your passion shines through for your work. Um, I just wonder because I, I, now I'm aware of time and we always mm. ask people for for a top tip, something to take away. And, and you've already given us lots of gems. But is there anything that you would that you'd like to sort of leave us with? Consider if the tassel is worth the hassle every single day. Ooh. Say that again because I like it. 
consider if the tassel is worth the hassle every single day because I think if you can easily lose sight of the bigger picture and actually if I knew now what I did what I now know back then I would have done it a thousand times I would have had the rubbish vibe but I would have felt as dark as I did because actually that's part of my journey and anybody else struggling with your PhD I promise you most of us get there and if you don't there's another door waiting for you I promise like life has a funny way of working out doesn't it it really does it really does and I and I think I just I I love that 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 positivity that isn't Pollyanna you know because this is hard one for you um but this sense of just trusting yourself trusting the process um, and yes, once you're in the PhD process, it, it, 99% of the time people get there. People, you get there. You get there. You mm. But also if you don't, that's okay too. That's what I also learned, that you find different paths and different things happen. Well, exactly. You're going you're gonna to get to where you need to be, whatever that is, whatever it looks like. Um, oh, I love it. I love it. Nicole, thank you so much. Thank you for um, all that you've shared, for your generosity of spirit um, and for just reminding us that keep going. (laughs) And then some more. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, And thank you all for listening. 